Welcome back guys. We're going to go ahead and take an up close look at the components on the bike because in the last video, link in the description, we didn't really get a good look at how they're mounted to the bike. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and reply to some viewer comments. So enjoy the video. It's cold. The thermometer on my speedometer is wrong about the temperature. What did you say? It says like 41. Hell no, it ain't no, no 41. It's the 30s, babe. It's like 30 degrees. Yeah. It was 30 degrees before I got on the bike. After I got on the bike suddenly turned into 12 degrees. <laughs> I'm not going to go into all the details about removing the brake shoes uh, in the coaster brake except that I just recommend unless you already have experience doing that don't do it on a motorized bike. It, do it on a bike without a motor. The Huffy Cranbrook you don't need to do it too. It works just fine with the sprocket and the brake arm but um, remove the brake shoes we had to take off the rag joint and that means at some point we had to put it back on and retrue it you guys know how enjoyable that is plus there was another hidden demon this nut that the brake arm mounts onto I'm just gonna call it a keyed nut butts up against the 17 millimeter nut they lock together to lock the axle in place so that you can adjust the tension 
on your bearings. You don't want this to be too loose, obviously you don't want it to be too tight. Getting that adjusted was a headache for two reasons. First off, it's one of those things where you really need three hands. And second, getting a wrench in here is impossible unless you have low profile wrenches. So what I had to do was take the coaster brake arm that I took off the bike use the Dremel to cut a slot in it so I could slide it onto here and then shave it down so it was thin enough to fit in there. Uh, and that wasn't fun. And even after all was said and done, when I thought I had it adjusted just right, it's not really on there near the way I want it to be. Let me see if you can hear this. You can kind of see it. I don't know if that shows up in the camera, but uh, it, it feels sloppy. I don't like it. So I'll be the first to admit, like I said, first time I ever did it. Didn't really know what I was doing. I thought it was going to be simple and straightforward. It wasn't. I recommend just leave it alone. Uh, experiment on a bike that doesn't have a motor on it and doesn't go 20 miles an hour. And from what I understand, not from personal experience, but if you just remove the external brake arm on a coaster brake and then you back pedal, it can actually lock up your entire wheel. That's just what I heard. So I didn't want to go through that. The only advantage that I got out of this entire debacle was the ability to pedal backwards. Until I hit the kickstand, of course. It'll still pedal forwards, but another disadvantage about it is, unlike most bikes that use cassettes, when you pedal forward, it usually catches right away. You know, it's got a little pedal forward and then it catches. When you remove the brake shoes, it takes a while to catch. And that really throws you off when you're trying to go from a dead stop. I heeded the advice of some of my viewers and they left some good information in the comments about that. Uh, and I went ahead and just decided to put my extra heavy duty 26 inch rim on there. I'm gonna leave the coaster brake. I'm not gonna mess with the internals. And as a bonus, I didn't even realize it at the time. Um, my hub adapter, my clamp, is one and a half inches. It fits this rim where it didn't fit that rim. I thought they were the same size or else I would have put it on a long time ago. So that removes a lot of headache for us in the future. But I will admit that the stock wheels that come with the Huffy Cranbrook have nice spokes. Okay, they're pretty thick for how cheap the bike is. So if you manage to not muck up this whole mess like I did, uh, rest assured that these wheels should do just fine. And here are the Mongoose pedals up close if you want a good look at them. Nice studs. But uh, they come with adapters to fit onto other bikes. But I'm glad we didn't have to use them because that would have moved them out about another half inch. And that's just a lot more leverage on the crank assembly right here. So I'm glad we didn't have to use the adapter on these. Uh, I forgot to mention what brake calipers these are. I'll put them in the description. These are actually uh, really nice. They're cheap, but they use thick metal. They're a simple design. They were super easy to install, and I think they're going to last a long time. If you live in conditions where it's really muddy and sandy, you might have an issue with these. Pulling them out, they're going to get gritty eventually, so just keep that in mind. If I pull them out and I take a damp rag, wipe the uh, top and wipe the bottom, we'll be good to go in the future, but keep that in mind. Also, I want to point out that if you decide to go with these fenders, because they are a cla because they're collapsible, to pull them out, it has this little knob here where you can put your finger on. If you're using knobby tires, keep in mind, as these bounce, it's possible that they might catch on that. Okay, so uh, either shave this down or lift your angle up higher so they can't bounce and hit the tire. Now, these are pretty smooth tires. I'm not worried about it on this bike. The way I have this brake light assembly mounted looks hideous from underneath, but I assure you, it's actually pretty solid. I have about five zip ties holding it to this bracket on the bottom of the seat. The zip ties are what's actually holding it to the bike, so it's pretty solid. But to keep the zip ties from moving and loosening up, I actually just filled in the gap with hot glue. I've used this technique to mount cameras to the bike and it's proven effective. The hot glue doesn't actually hold this to the bike, it just keeps the zip tie separated. And because it's hot glue, I can hit it with a heat gun, peel it off, and replace the entire assembly. It doesn't look pretty from underneath, but you know what? We're all good. Here's where the battery is mounted. Just using some Velcro inside of a water resistant pouch. Nothing fancy there. This is mostly to keep it away from water drops and to buffer some vibration from the motor. Cable management for the rear tail light, pretty basic. Velcro straps did the trick. From underneath, you can see them. From above, you're good to go. Here's where our flasher relay is mounted. 
and this allows me to adjust the knob from underneath. Our horn is just mounted to the frame using Velcro straps and, uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. Velcro straps, she's on there good. So this here is the only part of the bike where cable management's a real mess for now. It's like that because um, I just wanted to get it all secured and out of the way so I could test the bike on a couple of rides and we're good. So now I can go ahead and go to each one of these wires. I can trim them, re-solder them so we have a proper uh, bundle of wires here which we can put a loom over and that should hide them. It'll just be a wire loom. All this will be inside of it. When we add our charging circuit, we're just going to tap into these wires right here and probably mount it right here as well. Here's our control. Just mount it right there. I need to tilt it down a little bit, but other than that, we've got the wire running along here going down. Okay, simple. Here is our stoplight switch. This worked out. This was luck. I decided to go with the dual brake lever. So we have the front and rear brake on this one lever. And because of that, the cables added a convenient mounting point for the brake light switch. This is lightweight plastic, so I just used some Velcro straps to secure it to these two cables. And it's on there really good, it ain't going nowhere. And then I drilled a small hole through the brake lever, bent the wire at a 90 degree angle, ran it down to the bottom, put a bead of solder on the bottom, bead of solder on the top, and now that wire is good to go. And if I do need to remove it or adjust it for some reason, I'll just heat the solder up and it'll drip off and be good to go. As the brake pads wear down and the lever wants to draw closer to the throttle, this I can adjust with this screw in or out to move the brake light switch closer or further away. So, hey, that was all just luck. It wasn't planned or anything. I just put it there and it worked out. Now that squeaking you hear, it's just the spring rubbing against the, the housing. So a little bit of oil there might take care of it. Or maybe a piece of heat shrink tubing over it. That'll probably do the trick. The speedometer is wireless. It's got its own little battery in there. It talks to a little sending unit or a sensor right here. And this sensor reads this magnet that's mounted to the spokes. So you get a little magnet here. And when it passes by, it just does the calculations and then sends the information to the computer. Now, so currently this is wrapped with Gorilla Tape because I'm in incredibly muddy conditions and I just wanted to add a little bit of extra waterproofing. But if you mount this to the bike the way it was intended, it actually looks pretty good. It's very low profile um, and it doesn't look ugly or anything, but this provides a little bit more waterproofing. See, both the computer and the sending unit have a rubber o-ring around the battery compartment that makes them waterproof or at the very least water resistant. But my conditions here are pretty extreme and it rains a lot, so I wanted to shore that up a little bit more. The bar and blinkers with mirror assembly, here's how they're mounted to the bike. That's pretty simple and self-explanatory. They have a piece of rubber, a rubber bushing that goes into the bar, and as you tighten the two nuts together, it uh, expands, clamps against the uh, the inside of the bars and well I'm pretty sure you guys know how that works but it's got a hollow bolt that goes through allows me to run the wires through the handlebars where I just drew a where I just drilled a small hole to let the wires come out on both sides um, I'm gonna cover this probably with some electrical tape or some black duct tape so it's not so ugly I used hot glue as a, a wire bushing uh, because there I don't didn't even know of a bushing that small exists to protect these wires from the small hole I drilled in the metal. Getting the wires through here took a little bit of time, but it was just basically trying to fish them through this hole with a, another wire with a hook on it and just try and pull them through. All right, let's reply to some viewer comments. Daniel, as promised, I'm replying to your comment. Sorry, I didn't make it into Friday's video. But before I reply to your comment, I want to take this opportunity to, um, to discuss something I've noticed when it comes to these bikes. Uh, this is true through a lot of things in life. But uh, when somebody tells you that they know what they're talking about because they've built a lot of bikes, that is usually a surefire way to know immediately that they are just full of it. Uh, somebody who says, man, I know what I'm talking about. I built hundreds of these bikes. Whether that's true or not, guys, you probably know by now that these bikes are like puzzles. Okay, you just you get the right piece, you put it together, and the bike will run. Will it run for a long time? Well, that depends on if you really know what you're doing. But somebody who actually does know what they're talking about, they'll do something like, uh, what a viewer here, Miguel. Miguel 
I personally think he knows what he's talking about when he comments on my videos. He's a new commenter. I've just seen him pop up recently, but he has a bunch of comments on a lot of my videos. And he'll take a certain topic in that video, he'll discuss it and share his experience with that topic. And he has some good information. So Miguel, I want to thank you for the information, you, information you've been supplying in uh, my videos. Some of it's actually going to help me, especially this one about uh, another way to mount a hub adapter so it won't slip instead of using a key to drill a hole and use a set screw. Now, a lot of you guys might have already known that. I personally didn't. I would have, it would have taken me forever to think about that. So, thank you, Miguel. See, that is how you can tell when somebody knows what they're talking about. Details, experience, no BS. And they don't try and justify what they're talking about. They just state it, and that's it. Anyways, to get back to your, um, your comment, uh, Daniel thought that you can't have a vacuum leak on these two-stroke motors because they don't have vacuum lines. And that might be true. I'm not a two-stroke mechanic. Uh, maybe you call it an air leak. Maybe it's called something else. The situation I had was actually that the throttle piston inside the carburetor for that carburetor was just a little too small. So even when the throttle was closed all the way, air was passing around the throttle piston and causing my high idle because of a lean mixture. We remedied that and the bike's running great now. Um, so would you call that a vacuum leak or would you call that an air leak? What would you call that? Because if we're splitting hairs here, then don't do that. If you know what I'm talking about, instead of posting something like what you posted, correct me. Give me constructive criticism and I can help other people as well. All right. So guys, if I tell you I'm going to reply to a comment, your comment in a future video, don't freak out. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to slam you or anything. There are some instances where the community simply needs to see what you wrote, whether it's good or bad, to help people out. I want to thank everybody, and there's a lot of you guys who replied to suggestions about what spark plug you recommend using in a past video to help out another viewer. This helps me as well. I noticed NGK seems to be the dominant recommendation here, but I've also noticed that it's not always the same NGK plug. There are a few variations. There are some that are more than others, but what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to buy a couple of different NGK plugs based off of your guys' recommendations, throw them in bikes, and just see if I notice a difference. Um, maybe you won't notice a power difference, but maybe there'll be, um, maybe one plug will be withstanding the um, environment better than another, the internal environment of the engine, whatever you want to call it, the wear and tear. Matthew apparently thinks that a VIN number Cranbrook is uh, hilarious or ridiculous, and honestly, I agree with you, Matthew. The simple fact that this is even a this is even a thought that you might actually have to do this in some states is ridiculous in my opinion but hey some states you just you got to do what you got to do me i'm just doing this for fun and i don't know if i'm actually going to try and get it then but i probably will just for the hell of it and give you guys some information ethan's dream might come true on one of my bikes i might uh might just have to get an air horn for the cranbrook Oh, that would be interesting. JCX, I appreciate uh, your little experience here that you shared with the community about pretty much going through the exact same thing we're going through on the Cranbrook. He uh, went through all the electronics, lighting, horn, all that good stuff, and then attempted to actually get his bike inspected in VIN. Um, you can go read what he wrote, uh, but he... Um, he actually tried to get some information in writing uh, when they wouldn't give him a VIN number for inspection because they claimed that it was legal to ride his bike. So maybe he lives in a state where the, the law is kind of gray, like here in Louisiana, the law is gray. Uh, it's just up to interpretation by individual cops. So him posting his experience with this situation, uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert, for your comment about the Cranbrook and how it looks. Honestly, if you would have seen this bike two hours before I cleaned up all the wires, you would have never expected it to turn out the way it did. I honestly thought it was going to be a rat's nest, but we got very lucky with the wires. But I'm replying to this one specifically because uh, Robert's comment reminds me of something I forgot to mention in uh, Friday's video. When you're purchasing these electrical components for your bike, you're going to need extra wire okay, to get them just to where they need to go. Obviously the wires included with them are going to be too short to reach the battery or the charging system or whatever. So what I did was I took each component, I counted how many wires it had, and then for each wire it had I added two feet. Okay, So if a certain component, say the brake light assembly, say uh, it had six wires. I don't remember how many it had, but just to say the brake light assembly had six wires. I added two feet per wire. 
and I did that for each component. That assured that I had plenty of wire with a little extra in case I need to redo something, move it around, or just fix something. All right, so a good little tip for you guys if you decide to go electronics on your bike. Each wire, add two feet. So Eric here has an interesting suggestion, which might come in handy for some of you guys in the future. Uh, when he was watching me take the Cranbrook down that rough trail, he mentioned that it looked painful. Honestly, it looked more painful than it was because the seat that comes on this bike has got those nice springs on it. It was rather pleasant, all things considered. But he recommends uh, taking some valve springs and putting them under your seat or replacing the stock springs with some valve springs. They're stiffer, they can handle more weight. And uh, that's, a, that's a cool little tip, might come in handy in the future. And I would also like to applaud Eric for giving proper constructive criticism. This is how you criticize a video so that future videos can be improved. He claims that some of the shots in one of my older videos was a little too distracting because I was doing picture in picture while there was fast moving objects. And when I go back and look at the video now, I can see where those could be distracting, especially if you're watching on a smaller screen. So instead of freaking out and saying I don't like the video thumbs down for whatever reason, he actually helps improve future videos. And anybody who can do that, I applaud you. Thank you. Another one from Eric here, he's on a roll. Uh, he's not sure how the kill switch works, if it opens the circuit or if it closes or shorts out the circuit. And this is a legitimate question for people who are just building their first bike or not familiar with motorcycles. Even I didn't know how the kill switch worked when I built my first bike. Um, essentially it shorts the circuit, it closes the circuit. So when you're not pushing it, it's open, doesn't do anything, there's no connection. This, that's why if you remove the kill switch wires, the uh, motor will actually keep running. So the kill switch doesn't keep your motor running. Uh, this came up when we were trying to diagnose an ignition problem that another viewer was having. Matthew, I wish I would have got to your comment before I ordered the um, CDI upgrade. Uh, I would have liked to check out this one that Zeta tested. Uh, if they noticed a difference because they have the dyno, then I probably would have gone with that one. But um, yeah, uh, if you find out exactly which one it is, go ahead and post it in the comments of this video and uh, I'll go check it out. Might come in handy in the future. Alright guys, so that's going to do it for this video. I have a bunch more to go through, but I'm going to reply to most of these on the keyboard. Anyways, thanks for watching. We'll see you in next Friday's video.